Well, good afternoon, everybody. We're glad that you could join us today for this discussion about COVID-19 and the effects on the Wilderness Stewardship Committee. My name is Randy Welsh. I'm the Executive Director for the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. And here with me today, uh, we have Bill Hodge, who is the Executive Director with the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. Uh, Merrill Harrell, who is the Executive Director for the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards. Um, Jimmy Godry, Andrew Downs, who is the Southern Region Rep for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Jimmy Godry, who is from the Northern Region of the Forest Service, and are expecting to have uh, Ray Torres, who's the Acting Director for Wilderness and Wild and Scenic Rivers, be joining us shortly. Um, before we begin the panel discussion and questions and answers, I just wanted to walk through a PowerPoint that would kind of describe our current situation and some resources that are available uh, for everybody. I'm assuming that you guys are seeing the, the screen. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm just going to. Um, so hopefully you guys are seeing the, the PowerPoint screen and our um, our agenda today is to do the introductions. Um, we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about the COVID-19 impacts and resources that are available to you, share some late-breaking information about congressional action that may be appropriate for your wilderness stewardship organizations. Then we're going to break into panelist remarks about what's happening with wilderness stewardship organizations, both locally and nationally, and how the agency is looking to respond in this um, unprecedented situation we find ourselves with. And then we're going to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and answers uh, from the audience. We'll try to provide opportunities for you to, um, to ask questions um, and to provide some commentary as well. Uh, because we are, do expect to have over 100 people, it's going to be uh, incumbent that everybody um, use appropriate video conferencing techniques, keep your phone on mute, um, just try not to over-talk each other, and uh, we will see how we can manage through this. We may not just have you write your, type your questions in, and then we'll uh, have one of our panelists respond to them as we get to that portion of the, the presentation. Um, again, our panelists today are Merrill Harrell from the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, Bill Hodge from the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation, Andrew Downs from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, uh, Ray Torres from the Wilderness Wild and Scenic Rivers Program staff in Washington, D.C., and Jimmy Godry from the Northern Region of the, Washington, of the Forest Service where he's the Wilderness Wild and Scenic River Specialist. And I'm your moderator today, um, the Executive Director for the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance, Randy Welsh. So uh, just briefly, everybody is, is experiencing the effects of COVID-19. What started out as uh, social distancing guidelines with no more than 10 people gathering has turned into national, state, and local orders to shelter in place for most people around the country. Uh, some, some states where the impact has not been as high have not yet put um, these orders in place, but they are coming. Um, living here in Oregon, uh, we've been under a shelter in place for the last uh, week and a half um, with great limits on any sort of travel. Um, or, or meetings except for emergencies to the grocery store. And I think you'll see that that's happening. All the restaurants, bars, um, the hospitality industry has basically been shut down. The travel sector has been shut down. And we're also seeing shutdowns in our state parks, our recreation sites. Um, some national forests have taken the, the, the pro proactive approach and have, have put in closures or have shut off recreation sites and trailheads. And we're seeing some national parks that are also going through closures. So it's a, it's a broad scale impact across many sectors of the economy, but it's hitting our particular outdoor industry quite dramatically. It's caused us to need to cancel 
all the volunteer activities because of the social distancing issues. It's caused volunteer groups to delay or cancel hiring of seasonal crews. Uh, we we're seeing cancellation of training um, that's going on as people were prepping for the beginning of summer. And groups are looking at finding new ways to get that training across, doing virtual techniques or um, just doing small groups or mentoring people one-on-one. -on -one. Anyways, this has resulted in our wilderness stewardship organizations and our wilderness stewardship community really struggling right now as we look to see what this future might look like. Um, so how do we go about understanding the, the impacts and what can we do to prepare ourselves and others that we work with about the COVID-19? Uh, first and foremost, because this is a medical issue, we want to go to the source, and that's the Center for Disease Control and their website, which has the latest information about the extent of the, the infections, um, practical steps that individuals and organizations and businesses can take to limit the spread of COVID-19 and to, um, you know, and then some other suggestions and ideas that might you, you might find useful as you plan for the future. In addition, many of our um, national outdoor uh, resource programs have developed um, COVID-19 resource pages. And I provided this PowerPoint is available on our website and will be available, um, you know, it's available now. You can download it. These are clickable links that will take you to the locations um, for the American Trails resource page, the Leave No Trace page, the Partnership for the National Trail System, and likewise. So I'll have slightly different um, information on them, but I think information that will be useful for the outdoor community, for the wilderness stewardship community. And before I leave it, uh, initially, when this first started, people were talking about the need for social distancing, and it was felt that going outdoors would be a great way to get that social distancing, a way to recharge. But, I sent, but since then, people have began to rethink that whole idea because of the potential impact that it would have of spreading the disease to rural communities. Uh, that first weekend after the social distancing guidelines were put in place for the state of Oregon, there was a mass exodus of people out of Portland to the beaches along the Oregon coast. And that was the last thing that those local communities wanted to see is people from Portland bringing the disease, potentially spreading the disease into their small rural communities with limited medical facilities. And so I think that we've seen a change in, in expectation and a change in mindset about if we do go outdoors, we should stay home, we should stay local, we should create backyard adventures for ourselves. And this fits in with the general travel concerns, but also about the impact that we will be having to rural communities and their, their ability to handle large numbers of people um, and potentially infections. Um, but in the, in the interim, Leave No Trace has come up with some suggestions for how to be outdoors during this time and the Outdoor Alliance as well has come up with some good suggestions. And we encourage you to apply those to your own situations and to think about ways that you as an organization can help spread the message locally and can um, use this as a time to you know, build local rapport and uh, support your local communities. Um, also, there has been some congressional action which may provide help and relief for wilderness stewardship organizations that are suffering through this period of having laid people off or are looking for ways to keep people employed. Um, first, the first stimulus bill that was passed was the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and it provides for national paid sick leave. It allows employers, um, employers to keep people on the rolls um, and to pay, provide uh, paid and unpaid sick leave and the ability to get a federal tax credit to help cover the cost of that leave. And then the CARES Act, which was just passed, that's the Coronavirus um, Response um, Act, is to providing additional unemployment benefits to those who have been laid off 
for recovery rebates, uh, direct payments to individuals that will help them uh, make it through this time, and then some different effects to retirement plans. They've extended um, the time period for withdrawing money, uh, some extension of time for paying back student loans, which could affect some of our employees. And then the Social Security tax payment has been deferred. There's also, and I think this is probably the big one that organizations will look at, is the opportunity for small business loans, some of which could potentially be free um, with the opportunity for advanced pay advances and then if you're in an area that's been directed under a disaster relief plan, um, you can qualify for additional small business uh, disaster relief loans. These, all, these programs all have particular unique requirements and we therefore suggest that you check out um, the information direct from the source. The Department of Labor has a, a Q and A page that talks about the um, family leave requirements, the the way to get repaid for giving paid leave. The Small Business Administration has all the information about how to apply for loans through the different lenders that provide those small business loans. And I would suggest that if you're interested in pursuing that, that you contact these organizations quickly. The amount of money is pretty much set aside for a first come first serve. So those that act fast are the more likely the ones to receive um, attention and to, to get some benefit from these programs. Um, in addition, I wanted to mention that there's continuing talk in Congress about uh, other ways of providing stimulus, around three, potentially around four. These are going to include a potential infrastructure bill and other means of providing economic stimulus. So lots of discussion going on right now. So now is not the time to be sitting home idle. Now is the time to be contacting your representative to let them know about your economic needs as an organization, about how this COVID-19 um, has affected you as an organization. This is a time where we should be rallying together as a nonprofit world, suggesting to the representatives that nonprofits need to be included. They have been so far. We need to see that they're included in these future stimulus rounds that we're a great source of employees, that our employees have been suffering effects, that we are a, a great source of, of economic stimulus in small communities, and that trails, recreation improvements, the other types of field work that we do um, can all be done quickly, can get jumped started, um, that we provide that economic stimulus in small communities and that our people are the ones that have been laid off and affected most by COVID-19. So it's time to let your representative know those needs so that you can be considered or we can be considered as a community and plan for as Congress works through these uh, potential bills. A couple other resources to consider. Um, I mentioned the disaster assistance loans, but many techno, techno, hmm, many technology companies have started their own small business relief funds. Amazon has one. Facebook's made a pledge. Uh, Grubhub, Intuit has a small business relief initiative. Um, you should check those out on their individual websites. Um, you've probably been getting plastered with um, emails about every potential opportunity, but if not, um, go to some of these larger ones and um, see what opportunities might exist for your small organization to uh, receive some sort of relief. And then, of course, spend the time talking to your funders, your foundations. Um, I think they are also talking about the effect of COVID-19 and are putting in place opportunities to extend time periods for grants and agreements. Um, to offer additional assistance. Um, so please, I think, avail yourself of all of these other resources. Um, so, okay, so let's, um, let's change gears now and we'll bring back our panelists and we'd like to hear from them about the effects that the COVID-19 has been having on their particular areas. So um, I think, guys, if you 
are speaking. Everybody should be able to hear you. Um, Bill, we'll just start with you. Um, we want to share a little bit, then we'll go to Merrill, Andrew, and then we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about what the effects from the agency standpoint will be with, with Ray and Jimmy. Yeah, thanks, Randy. You know, our first uh, way to respond to COVID was to first look out for our employees and uh, be good citizens. So we immediately, uh, frankly, before the shelter in place order uh, from the state of Montana came out that we went ahead and went to a working remotely uh, environment. We're all working from home and uh, allowing us to sort of follow those protocols. Uh, then quickly sort of started thinking about what are, you know, what are the ways we can position ourselves to get through this? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of unknowns. Uh, what is the duration of our change in our social, sort of social fabric? And what is that going to do to our ability to function? We're, we're in a unique window for us. We just finished up a, a fundraising part of our calendar with our mountain film tour. Uh, but our field season doesn't get uh, going until June here with our seasonal staff starting in May. Uh, and so it was fairly simple for us to shift to this this uh, environment of working for home for now uh, and start making steps to prepare for a season that looks maybe like we expected it to look or a season that might look entirely different. Uh, we've set some mile posts uh, out there. Uh, April 17th is going to be our first marker when we have to make a decision whether our season is going to start uh, in June with our volunteer programs or not. Of course, we took some early steps to cancel any public events we had uh, remaining on our calendar. We had a wilderness speaker series event we had to cancel. Uh, but for now, we're continuing to behave as if we're going to have a field season and taking the usual steps and some extraordinary steps and in, in communicating with our community uh, that we plan to have a field season. We don't know for sure that we will, because obviously we don't know how much this is going to escalate, how much we may need to continue to follow shelter in place orders, which would effectively been the bringing an end to a field season, uh, but also making sure that we have processes ready to deal with our new environment. Things are gonna be changed regardless. What are we gonna do about uh, social distancing in the field? What are we gonna do about tool handling and um, augmenting, uh, say food handling practices, those sort of things. Uh, the things that I've had to do as the executive director of the organization is to look into the resources that you just went through on the PowerPoint there, Randy, and, and one thing I would add is, is with the SBA loan programs, particularly the, the payroll protection plan, uh, you, you should not only be reading and looking into that, but I would, if I was you, I would be going ahead and contacting a loan officer. Those loans are not going to come from SBA. They're going to come from a local financial institution. Uh, be talking to a loan officer at your local bank who is prepared to work with those loans. Uh, be looking at, there's a sort of a a pre-application form that's out there now that could tell you what documents you may need to be thinking about getting together. But that, that entire plan is meant uh, to allow organizations, including nonprofits, the ability to keep staff on payroll at a time when maybe the knee-jerk reaction would be to let folks go. Uh, and so we're going to take full advantage of that. And so that's just some of the things that we're doing to put, put things in place. All right, Merrill. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, similarly, um, with Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards, we wanted to act quickly to prioritize safety um, and safety of our team, safety of our Forest Service partners. We work on 10 national forests in eight different states, um, and we wanted to be cognizant of, of needs of our agency partners um, and also the communities that we work in and trying to make sure that we are not vectors of spreading COVID into rural communities that may not have the capacity to handle the challenges. So um, we uh, are on, at, I think week three, it's starting to blur together, but of teleworking. Um, and we have made pretty, some pretty dramatic changes to our expected season. Um, we were going to be bringing on crew leaders. We do field crew work um, as, and start our training with those crew leaders, as well as bring on um, crew members, uh, as well as additional wilderness specialists who do technical work with our Forest Service partners, um, cabin hosts, um, and a, a number of other employee, seasonal employees. We've postponed all of that hiring. Um, and we are waiting until it's safe to put folks in the field. 
Um, we've also postponed or canceled uh, trainings, including crosscut saw trainings, volunteer days, other events that would be bringing people together into the field. Um, and we've done that uh, both in terms of our group work and also we're holding off on for the staff that we have, we're not letting in anyone go, we're finding ways to um, build our team and work really closely with our Forest Service partners. And I can't say enough about um, how wonderful they've been. Uh, John Campbell and Chris Forrell in Region 8 have just been fantastic. And um, we've been in really close communication with them and our forests that we partner with to find really creative ways to have our wilderness stewards um, work from home. You know, what are those tasks that are valuable and important um, to our partners and um, can be safely done virtually and remotely. And we're, we're uh, working together to be creative, to work down those to-do lists that many of us have, um, but sometimes those tasks further down the list uh, get pushed off because of the, the needs of the moment. So what is the way to, what are ways to take advantage of the opportunity we have now to uh, be behind our, our at our desks and behind our screens um, and really work through some of that work. Um, so, uh, and then we will put people back into the field when it's safe to do so. We're, we're also holding off on the individual solo work, so our rangers and our specialists, um, because the risk might be low that they get injured, but they might get injured and um, that could really, there, there might be a, a, a capacity constraint for local emergency response um, and it also might add to the strain of the local health systems. So we've made the decision to not put folks in the field for now and um, wait until it's safe for everyone to do that. Um, we also are working to um, help share information that we have, whether it's through our social media feeds or through newsletters. Um, when our Forest Service partners have information that they need to convey to the public, can we help do that? Um, what are ways that we as an organization and as a community can still be providing support to the public, um, to the folks that we can connect with um, to help keep them safe and help keep communities safe and help be continue to be good stewards of the of the resource. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to do that uh, even in this current time and we're trying to find those opportunities. Um, I will say that another opportunity we've been taking advantage of is uh, we are distributed, our team is distributed, and so technologies like Zoom have um, been really great at helping us stay connected as a team. Um, and we're taking full advantage of those opportunities. We're having twice a week um, all team uh, meetings just to check on one another. I think it's really important, especially with all the social distancing direction that we're taking care of one another um, and really investing in our um, in our community. And that's one thing that uh, I think this group has been so wonderful at doing and Randy has been great at leading. Um, I, I'm appreciative of this opportunity. I think the more that we can be uh, in conversation with one another, helping each other out, sharing information, um, that will be creating ties that, 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 are, that are wonderful and that hopefully we can continue even past this current crisis. Um, we're also looking for ways to be supportive of our communities. Um, many of you may have local partners who you've worked with um, who are struggling right now, local businesses um, and, and others. And we're looking for ways to support those local partners and businesses and maybe share information about what they need um, and just really invest in the communities that we work in. Um, so, I think those are some things we're working on right now. We're also, of course, doing financial planning. Um, we're anticipating a significant drop off in individual support and we're um, doing scenario planning to make sure that we are anticipating that and reacting to safeguard the stability of our organization. I'm sure that many of you are thinking about similar needs and fiscal needs. Um, we're looking into the CARES Act uh, and also just thinking about what will it take to safely get back out into the field and have a successful season when we can do that? Um, so what are what are the things we need to do to prepare for um, different operating protocols and how can we make decisions about when it's safe to go back out in the field? 
Um, and then also looking ahead to the challenges that will exist on the ground. I think one thing that this moment has highlighted is how important it is to have these outdoor places for people to go. Um, and those places need stewardship. Um, and so what will that look like um, both towards the end of this year and into the future to really invest in the capacity needed to provide safe access, high quality access, sustainable access um, for people and what does that mean for the stewardship community? Um, and then also what does it look like maybe to have some of our gatherings turn more virtual in this interim period? Are there opportunities to bring people together to do training um, that can be done virtually? Not all of our training can safely be done virtually or practically be done virtually, but some of it can. Um, so what are opportunities to get creative and to do that, to continue to build the stewardship community in this interim period? Thanks. All right, well, thank you, Merrill. Uh, let's go to Andrew Downs from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy and also the board chair for the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. Yeah, thanks, Randy, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and everybody for tuning in. Um, you know, I'll, I'll try to keep my comments as relevant as possible because as all you guys can imagine, the AT, you know, 27 wilderness areas, but a myriad of other land management um, agencies we work with. We also, you know, engaged in volunteerism and, and management of the asset in a lot of different ways as well, direct volunteerism and then facilitating the volunteerism of other organizations. Um, one, and, and I, I think Merrill and Bill both had uh, really good comments and, and doing a lot of similar things. Um, one part of our responsibility has really been a focus on con collecting information and then convening partnerships around responses. And so, you know, in places where the Appalachian Trail goes through national park, national forest, state land, um, we are trying to collect uh, information and disseminate that information not only to um, the volunteer groups we work with, but also make sure that those agencies and partners are all talking together so they're not essentially moving around a problem instead of addressing a problem. Um, you know, we see a, a range of different shutdowns and guidance from states, from the federal government, from different agencies. And that has really started to move use around. Um, and that has resulted in new congregation points, new vectors of uh, potential exposure. And we, we've been really trying to be proactive on, on making sure all these decision makers at all these agencies are, are using the same information, have the use patterns of the, of the Appalachian National Scenic Trail kind of firmly in their understanding. And so when they do, um, choose to, to close a particular, um, you know, access point or park or, or what have you, that they know um, that it may have, you know, unintended consequences and the agencies that might feel those unintended consequences have an opportunity to weigh in on those shared decision-making processes. So it's been a lot of um, communication I think, and, and also a lot of communication um, among our sort of range of volunteer partners. So um, we've asked, I, I think two weeks ago, we asked um, all volunteers to um, stand down. And those are both the programs that we direct, directly administer. And then um, um, also with volunteer organizations that we facilitate. Um, and that has been a challenge because as you imagine, the exposure in, in New York, for example, which is an AT state, is a lot different than the exposure in rural Southwest Virginia, which um, just had its first case of, of COVID very recently. Um, and so what we're also trying to do is, is make sure people understand how recreation and how recreation in the backcountry and in, in wilderness can act as a vector, as, as Merrill suggested, to other communities that might not have a lot of other um, exposure points. Um, you know, the a Appalachian Trail, we have long distance hikers from all over the world that are on the trail now. We've asked them all to get off the trail and provided guidance for them to, to do so. 
Um, but what, what we're trying to understand really is um, is the systems that are that exist around the Appalachian Trail and, and specifically points in wilderness for this conversation. You got the volunteer systems, you got the administrative systems, you got the user systems, and you know when it comes to a disease like COVID, you know the disease doesn't know those b barriers, and so all those systems are interacting. Um, daily and we want to make sure that the the people who can affect change in those systems are using all the same information know what each other is doing um, so we've been we've been talking a lot we've been bringing on a lot of management partners and and, and to zoom calls and, and things like that and sharing a ton of information through our volunteer management teams also all the way up to the department level and and I think what's that that's done is is made sure that everybody um, understands and is and is um, and is calculating as best they can how a resource like the AT and, and trails can affect their other decision processes, whether it's a, a town greenway system or whether it's um, you know a community that that might rely on on um, tourism and visitation to some of these natural assets, understanding how all those parts are at play, affect exposure, affect economic viability, and then um, how decisions can get enacted and disseminated throughout the user groups and the other volunteer organizations that, um, that have a management uh, role. So we've been doing a, a lot of convening. Um, we've been doing a lot of communicating with our volunteers as well. Um, trying to determine what points of exposure they see, what problems they see cropping up out there, um, trying to trying to listen um, while also trying to make sure that everybody is using the same information because there's a lot of different information out there. There's a lot of information that that I think some folks think are are not as relevant um, to their current situation. And 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 going back to that sort of systems approach, we're bringing a story to everybody that that the AT is a connector between um, a lot of systems uh, in the context of COVID that, that they might not have already known. Uh, a lot of our work is being um, informed by our previous work on norovirus. So we've had norovirus outbreaks on the AT. I understand those diseases are very different, but things like physical proximity play a, play a, a role in both transmissions. And so We've been using past experience on things like that to create context for people when we um, talk about the potential for closing an area that that folks might really value in terms of mental health at a time like this. And um, I think that's been really valuable. Um, definitely focused on our, our employees and volunteers and partners and communities as well, um, making sure that, that they, um, that they are getting from us clear guidance on how to limit their exposure around their work on the AT. Um, and so we're all working from home. We've asked all volunteers to stand down and um, we've asked long distance, we have asked hikers, um, first long distance hikers, now all hikers to avoid the Appalachian Trail. And for those who don't know, you know, the, the AT is not your normal trail. We, we There's a lot of um, congregation points, a lot of visitation, and right now um, there's a lot of rain, and that tends to bunch people up as well. And so we are really—it's um, with a heavy heart, honestly, because we want people to get outside. Um, but but we have tried to be as as clear and direct as possible. And I'll just say one other thing um, about a narrative um, that that we're trying to to um, establish with all the communities we work with and. I mean that in both the physical townships, but also the volunteer community at large, things like that. Commonly, when a rule comes out, the thinking is, okay, if I meet these bullet points, I can follow the rule. But right now, what we're dealing with is um, the opposite situation. The bullet points are actually creating, trying to deliver a, a broader message, and that message is, essentially stay at home if at all possible. So instead of maybe trying to work with a volunteer to get this job done, if there's a closure in place, like, you know, privies are a big example for us. Um, 
how do I get to the privy if there's a, a, a you know, if the government shut down? Am I allowed to do this and this and this? And, and we'll work with them. But in this case, it's, it's kind of the opposite. These things are shut down. These are the rules in place. Your standard operating procedure should be do nothing um, unless otherwise, otherwise um, informed. And that's been a real tough pill uh, for our volunteers to swallow. I think they love working on public land. They love working on the Appalachian Trail. So we've been doing a lot of communication and a lot of messaging around personal safety and around the fact that um, there'll be a lot of work to do when this is over, but the key is to make sure that you're there and healthy when we have the opportunity to get back out there. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, primarily what we've been doing is, is collecting information, um, convening, and then um, checking back in with people to make sure that, that the information we've got is relevant for the challenges that they see. Um, around you know their interest or community or or um landscape all right well thank you andrew so let's transition now to ray tory the acting director for wilderness and wild and scenic rivers with the u.s forest service and uh, jimmy godry and to hear a little bit about what the agency response has been to the covid crisis what wilderness stewardship groups might expect um, in terms of some of the messaging or miss message or you know duplicate messaging that might be happening uh, around the country or lack thereof and so uh, ray would you um go ahead and, and share with us and again thank you ray for yeah randy can you, yep sure can, can you hear me randy okay good. so yeah. uh first randy, thanks thanks for inviting me on to, into this forum um you know turning off of what andrew just said uh it's really critical that that communication among all the partners happens and and uh, uh so we get an understanding of what what we're all facing and actually each of you um what you outlined is really what the forest service has been facing as well um so let me give you a little bit of uh, catch up speed where we're at in terms of what's been done to respond to the initial uh, parts of this and then and then i want to tear a little bit off of what andrew's talking about in terms of recovery so um, we've been working at the Washington office in, in helping to develop some guidelines for the field on how to respond uh, to this COVID-19 uh, event. Um, and it's been changing or, or not really changing. It's been mod being modified and expanded each, each day as something else comes up. Um, so <clears throat> currently right now, uh, there's a number of forests that, that have closed uh, their campgrounds or day use facilities, some cases trailheads, um, or put limits on what dispersed camping looks like, uh, those type of things. I know in the forest uh, that I normally work at here on the Monongahela, um, they've closed all the campgrounds, closed day use areas, and um, they've limited uh, group sizes in dispersed areas to 10 or less, which follows the national standard. Um, yeah, but they didn't close any areas off. So you can still get in the dolly sods. You can still hike trails uh, and fish. Um, and that that we'll see how that goes, because that can be problematic on really high high visitation areas like the dolly sods. And as you guys are aware, down trail that, that that's an issue that, or can be a trailheads. So we'll we'll see how we, it goes from there. But typically, that's what most of the forests are doing. Um, Early on, we decided to um, give some decision space to the, the regional offices and the forests in terms of how they manage their their uh, their uh, areas. Uh, basically, because there are so many counties, so many states involved now, with so many different uh, direction in terms of uh, uh, shelter in place and and limited. Uh, driving capabilities and, and group sizes and those type of things that, that we really can't manage that at the Washington office. So we've been giving general direction in terms of, of recreation facilities and, and kind of what we think is how, how they should approach it. But we've been limiting it to uh, to the regional offices and the four supervisors of each four to deal with because they, they are real specific. Um, as Meryl pointed out, you know, the whole length of the Appalachian Trail has a number of different forests on it, a number of different jurisdictions, and everybody's doing it different. Um, likewise, managing their staffs as well. And, and like all of you, almost all of us are teleworking. 
Uh, there's minimal staff in the field uh, to do work. Um, everybody's working from home pretty much, um, which which is a new new thing for the Forest Service because like all of you, we're used to being out in the field and doing stuff. We're used to being at the office meeting with people. So this has been a real, a real um, uh, uh, innovative way of doing business that we've had to kind of adapt to every day, as I'm sure you all have. Um, so that's kind of where we're at in terms of, of, of where we are up to now. Um, and I can address some questions after this. But now we're beginning this discussion of, of how do we manage it through this next three or four weeks? And then what does the recovery look like? Because uh, we're not going to turn off the faucet here and say, okay, we're all open for business again um, day after tomorrow. So, so what does that mean in terms of hiring, in terms of staff, in terms of getting people back out in the field to do trail work? If that happens in June, if that happens in July or August or whenever that happens, um, what about those uh, um, agreements, those partnership agreements? Um, and this is not just within the, the recreation and wilderness partner community. This also goes on to the active management side. Uh, I just uh, um, got information from Rough Grass Society, which does a lot of work on the in the Northeast and up through the Great Lakes and down through us. Um, in habitat management, uh, and they're they're struggling. Uh, their their business model is based on on events that people come to for fundraisers, and and that's not happening. And they don't have um, a substantial platform uh, on a virtual network that that is conducive to that. So they're trying to figure out how they're going to move forward with that. And they've notified us that some of the things that they wanted to do with us, they're not going to be able to do. Uh, and there's other groups that are similar um, that were the same as you. They're working with us to try to figure out how we all move forward to do what we normally do. So we're looking at, at um, kind of gaming out some scenarios on how we gear back up um, as we start to recover from this uh, and what that looks like. And we, we don't have any answers yet. And it's obviously going to be some places will probably open up before other places do. Um, and then we have, we'll probably have some kind of, you know, guidelines in terms of the group size that goes in to work on trails or, um, you know, uh, as, as Andrew said, how do you set up the distancing if you're going to go work on trails to maintain some kind of social distancing, if that's still in effect for that particular location. Um, uh, so we're kind of taking a look at that and then, um, uh trying to figure out what to do with that i know on the fire side that's a lot of the same discussion um uh, and we have an incident management team that's pretty much directed it at the washington office of looking at the the fire season coming up as an interagency uh role uh and and how do we manage large fire camps uh for this upcoming season region three in arizona and new mexico fire season starts now uh when i was down there in the gila our our some of our Three to five hundred acre fires were in the very first part of March, and it'll go through through June, um, and then the rest of the country kicks in after that, and eventually ends up in Montana, up there where you folks are at uh, later in the season. Um, so, how do we respond to that given these these parameters? How do we manage a fire camp with all those people? I mean, fire camps notoriously have have camp crud that goes through it, and so what do what do we do with it? How does that look? Uh, do we limit our responses? Um, do we look at, at different ways of initial attack? All of these things are being discussed now to try to figure out a strategy to go forward as, as this fire season approaches us. And so some of those lessons that we pull out of that um, can, can move to the teams that go out in the field uh, for trail work um, and to do those rest, that restoration work that we do in the field as a wilderness group and as a recreation group. So. This is evolving. Uh, we're learning every day uh, and discussing every day. And I know uh, for those of you on, on the call, uh, the, the people on the panel here uh, met uh, earlier in the week and we had a very similar discussion, which is what this call came out of. Uh, so I, I, I um, would encourage that we continue this dialogue. I also have on the phone, uh, you know, I have some of my staff, uh, Eric's on, uh, Dusty's on, and 
and uh, Peter, I think, is on our new uh, wilderness program manager that takes the place of Sandy, um, as as well as um, uh, Richard Thornburg, who's from our congressional relations uh, staff, and he's our hard contact with them. And I asked him to come on, on not so much to make a presentation, but but to listen, Randy, to to and and all of you to what your concerns are, what your issues are, um, as we move forward. As as you mentioned, Randy, uh, Congress has has gone through these three stages now in this last bill that, that you all are talking about, uh, trying to figure out how to utilize. Uh, there's now a fourth round that's being talked about. And there'll probably be a couple more rounds after that. This next one is also gonna be infrastructure and really jobs focused. Uh, and we're beginning to provide some, some input into that in different areas. It's, it's still really kind of uh, uh, loosely structured and just in the formative stages. Uh, uh, in DC, um, and so uh, so those are some of the things that 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 the agency is is going through now. A lot of similar situations to what you all are struggling with, trying to figure out on how to move forward. We didn't bring on a lot of staff um, in the recreation side, as well as some other fields areas. Um, uh, we are very concerned um, about the partnership relation in terms of your your health as an organization. On all of yours, uh, not just in the Wilderness and Rec Group, but across the board on, on all of our partners, Nature Conservancy, everybody. Um, because we we know that you guys do, a, if not the majority of the work, a lot of the work that, that this organization does and meets meets what Congress asks us to do. Um, so uh, I hope that you continue to have us uh, as part of this discussion because we can certainly relay um, uh, to our counterparts, uh, you know, in, in the DC structure and the regional office and, and even the forest units, um, what you're struggling with and, and maybe uh, jointly we can come up with some, some things that'll help. Uh, so Randy, I'll, I'll let it go there um, and I'll turn it over to Jimmy. Jimmy's can, can address some more local issues that they're dealing with down there and, and, um, and kind of go from there. Yeah, appreciate that, Ray. And uh, Jimmy, yeah, if you could um, talk briefly about what you're doing locally within the Forest Service in the Northern Region, and then talk a little bit about the training um, thoughts relative to virtual training, given that the, the Rocky Mountains um, Skills Institute is being postponed. You bet. Um, hey, um, thanks for pulling this together. Great to be here, and I don't know who's out there, but um, I think a lot of us know each other, and so it's good just to be a part of this discussion. And um, I know for me, just um, over the past few weeks, being able to communicate with those of you on the um, panel here, but others about what's going on has been helpful, not just from an information standpoint, but just uh, feeling that connectedness of a community. And uh, so good to be here. Um, I'm anxious to get to the panel part of, or the town hall discussion part of this. And so Ray um, is right on with how things are playing out. Um, you know, locally, my experience has been um, a lot of focus in the recreation program on developed sites and facilities and making sure that we're providing for public safety for both employees and um, members of the public. In my mind, we're, we're starting to transition into this phase of thinking long-term. Um, and some of that involves our partners uh, that help us with wilderness work, as well as trails and other things, and making sure that those partnerships remain sustainable. And that when we look back on this um, down the road, that um, we kind of see, um, see what opportunities we seized and um, took advantage of um, given where we are at and um, and can't come out on the other end with um, kind of a path forward, a program of work, so to speak. And so um, here, a few of the things we've been doing is reaching out to partners specifically. Um, I work closely with our volunteers uh, and service person, Joni Packard, and I know she's been doing calls individually with partner organizations to get a sense for how things are going. Um, I know that the forests and the forest supervisors have been encouraged by leadership to engage with partners as well here. And so 
What I can say is that in the mix of trying to manage a whole lot going on, um, some of that communication probably has um, is, is still to come. Um, and that goes for us in the regional office as well. Um, training wise, um, uh, I know that the folks in the Southern region have been on a similar path as us, but uh, we, we've been hosting this Northern Rockies Wilderness Skills Institute for the last few years. And just this week decided we weren't going to be um, doing that. Um, it was our third year um, to do this. And so um, it was a big decision for us. But just looking at um, where our partners were as far as pulling employees um, to participate and where volunteers might be at the time. And then also agency. I mean, we're starting to now get some guidance in the region about when we should postpone pulling on uh, hiring seasonals till and vehicles and the utilization of um, housing and how that might look. Um, just a, a bunch of different things that will affect both how we manage our workforce, our seasonal workforce, as well as how we work with our partners and volunteers. And so, um, so yeah, I don't, um, I think what we're trying to do right now, and I, I don't want to take um, full credit for this because I know that on the line as well are my counterparts from other regions, um, as well as um, other staff from this region. But I know many of us are going down the same road, and that's why I think communication is going to be really important so that um, we can pull resources together. And so one of the things I know we're looking at training wise, Randy, I think you hit on was um, we're not going to be able to do some of this in-person training that we typically do, but what do we do uh, in the months ahead to provide growth opportunities for long-term seasonal employees or even permanent employees who may have a different um, workflow in front of them um, and the opportunity to maybe um, take on something they hadn't before? And then also, how do we remain flexible enough to train employees that might come on and i when i say employees i mean partner employees as well as ours and volunteers um you know really just kind of be flexible enough to adapt to a season that might trickle in uh if it trickles and what is that going to look like and um so anyway i think that's where our energy's been going here um i, I think communication has been um key i think um spent many hours doing what we're doing now in front of a screen talking to other folks and uh and, and um it's it's been helping i think and so with that i'll just kind of uh pass and uh, open up for questions i guess for andy yep that's uh, what we're going to try to do here is um so as as individuals who are listening in and this will be a little interesting we've got just shy of 100 people on the the webinar. So what I'd ask is that you would type your questions into the question dialog box. Um, if you have a question specifically that we can try to answer from one of our panelists. And if you would like to to um, say something to speak that can keep it concise, if you would just type your name into the the, the question box. I will then turn around and recognize you and um, open up your mic to be able to share with the audience. So as we get this queued up, again, use the question dialog box um, and we'll go from there. So kind of the first question I have, Ray, is um, I think for you, uh, does the Forest Service have a date in mind or a best guess to inform nonprofits? on prohibiting or limiting volunteer labor on federal lands in May through September. Um, do we have anything definitive? You know, uh, we don't at this point. I, again, it goes back to, uh, I don't think you're gonna see that come out of the Washington office in terms of a national limit. I think what we're gonna do is, is probably leave that up to the regional foresters and the forest supervisors in the particular locations uh, managing it based on on their circumstances um, with with their areas. I think as as areas start to recover, I think we'll see some loosening up of local restrictions and state restrictions. And I think at that point, I know we're certainly uh, eager to get people back on the ground. 
Um, so I, I think at that point, um, we'll, we'll start to get some things moving forward. The, I talked to Chris French about this, who's the associate, or is the uh, deputy chief, and to Alan Rowley, the associate deputy chief. And uh, Alan, Alan said his, his initial comment would be, um, you know, work with your local, local force service office and your regional office in terms of, of what that volunteer um, status kind of looks like. But his, his thought was, was stay, as long as you stay within the parameters of the state or the county or the city jurisdiction there in terms of whatever their direction is in terms of group size or, or closed areas or that kind of thing, um, that if a group was, uh, if you had a group of four or five people that were going to go out and do trail work and uh, fit within all the parameters and uh, kept social distancing and wasn't going in an area that's closed for some other reason, um, that that uh, we, could, we could try to accommodate that. Um, and again, that's general direction from the Washington office uh, because we don't know what what each four supervisors dealing with out in that particular field. But that was that was the, the feel at the Washington office was, was we need to try to get that work done as best we can. Keeping in mind, as as Merrill pointed out and Andrew pointed out, keeping in mind uh, community safety um, and uh, employee safety in terms of, of not getting them to, into an exposed situation where, where we could uh, uh, start another round of, of this as well, because that's another one of the concerns is, is how do we implement a recovery and still not, not promote a respread of this? Um, and uh, uh, that, I know that's a concern nationally as well. So, so that was kind of the general guidelines. I, I got a feeling that this, in the, within the next three to four weeks, this is gonna get a lot tougher. And I, I I wouldn't doubt that many of the areas, particularly in Region 5, Region 6, in the Northeast up in White Mountains, and um, maybe down in Region 8, that you find um, that, that the Forest Service uh, will have to postpone a lot of volunteer activities because it just doesn't fit within the parameter. It's not safe uh, to ex expose volunteers to that, that um, to give them that exposure and risk risk their safety um the chief has, has reiterated every week that we've had a meeting with the chief with vicky um the the three priorities the first and number one priority uh, is our own employees health and safety we don't want to get people exposed in the positions where where this is going to be a, an issue um the second one is uh, community health and and uh well partner self community health um, and the public's health, and and the the goal of trying to reduce the spread of this disease, um, this virus across the country. And then the third priority uh, is those priority mission areas for the Forest Service. If we can do the work in those priority mission areas, um, making sure the other two priorities are come are are done first, then we can proceed with it. So I think, Randy, I know that's kind of a convoluted answer. And it is a complicated deal, but um, I think those decisions are going to be based on 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 a risk management assessment by the force supervisor uh, in the regional force, or in terms of how much exposure they want to give to a volunteer group or to or to um, their own employees. Um, but I I see. Justin, as you all do watching the news, this is not going to get better tomorrow. I think we're in this for at least a month, maybe two months, and, and we're not at the peak. So those areas that are getting hit now, like in California and Oregon and, and down in, in uh, North Carolina and some of those areas down there where there's high use, uh, it, it, the picture is not going to be good. Um, so I can see some more uh, restrictions in terms of, of uh, what we do in given areas, uh, and that would include volunteer activity. Then we go into this recovery period like we've been talking about. Okay, great. 
Um, well, we've we've used up an hour. I think we've it's a quiet audience. We only have one other question, so I'm going to ask uh, my panelists if you can stick around for another five minutes, ten minutes or so, um, to respond to this this last question that we have here. And it's what what are you doing um, to booster the morale and keep employees feeling productive and energized? during this particular period of time? What kind of creative ideas are you employing to um, keep that morale high? Anybody want to start off on that one? Um, Randy, I'd like to, and um, this is Andrew from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, um, and what a great and, and timely question. But before I get to it, I just want to add something else to, to Ray Ray's comment, um, because I think it's important. Um, you know, the, the guidance to any volunteer um, or anybody out there, you, you know, you you can't tier it to one source. You've really got to take a big funnel of information. And I'll just, to put in context, you know, the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area, numerous wilderness areas, it it can have at any one day volunteers from a number of different volunteer organizations visitors from multiple states, each with their own sh shelter in place or lack thereof guidance. And then to run through that whole thing is the Appalachian National Scenic Trail, which has visitors from all over the world. Those people are all physically coming together um, and you know, potentially transmitting disease among them. And so you know, my guidance for volunteer groups is is look to your land management agency and your partner there for the guidance that's coming out there whether that's a district or a forest but don't limit the in the the information that you've got to that one um agency or one source to uh inform your decision making process really really take a net almost and and look at all the other guidance that's out there and, and consider that in the determination of whether you are going to ask people to get out there or not because there's a lot of there's a lot of other guidance at play when you, when you talk about public lands you know especially with the destinations that we have in wilderness the the vectors and the systems that are in play are, are really overlaid on each other and um i think you, you have to be um, observant of that overlay um, when you think about information you're getting. So it's not only the National Forest who manages the land, but maybe other yeah. recreation groups that are bringing users to the land and maybe other um, other organizations and partners with different users. Take all that information in when you're when you're thinking about making your decision process. I, I, I hope, um, yeah, I hope that's not in you know, bad advice. I'm not saying don't do what your land um, um, management partner says to do. Definitely follow that guidance. But if that guidance isn't the most restrictive, then definitely, you know, think about other places um, that that are providing information because because um, there's more things at play there. I guess is my point. Okay. Um, All right. Thanks, Andrew. There's but, a. Any other response on this particular question? We have a couple more questions come in that I'd like to get to as well. Yeah, on the morale question, Randy, you know, what I would say, as is, is counterintuitive as this is going to sound, is find a way to share with your community. Um, you know, there's a lot of creative things that have come out of this. Um, and this is an example of a community, right? We had a, almost 100 people who were part of this wilderness stewardship world uh, together. Uh, there's been a smaller working group of us working on putting together things like this webinar. Uh, it gives you, um, I don't know, a mental health break to, to realize that there's other people um, out there who want to tackle what you want to tackle. Uh, but also when it comes to like your local community, the community that is your volunteer base, the community that loves the place you work, how can you uh, be a community without physically being in the same space and get creative and thinking about that, you know, and then looking internally as an organization, how often are we getting together virtually? Uh, and how often can we get together virtually and maybe not talk about the heavy, you know, weighty, meaty issues of the day, but instead just, you know, check in, how's everybody doing? 
uh, you know, have a beer virtually, um, you know, just sort of gather with your community. So, you know, there are creative ways to do that. Um, and I think it's more important than ever because we are feeling so distant from one another to, to get super creative. I mean, it's been fun to watch people come up with their own Zoom rounds or, uh, you know, those sort of things. But how can we stay connected as a community, this community? How do you stay connected to your volunteer community? And how does your staff stay connected in a way that we're not always talking about the difficult decisions that may be in the days and weeks ahead? So that's my thoughts. Oh, and I'll just add, yeah, that's great. And I'll just add, um, you know, I'm really appreciative to be for the SAWS team and and for this community. Um, and we've been really enjoying getting together by Zoom twice a week. We do it in the beginning of the week and at the end of the week just to check in with one another. And um, we've gotten to see everybody's kids who have wandered through the Zoom meetings. We've gotten to see everybody's uh, fur kids um people's homes you know it's been really nice just being together in that way um and also just appreciating that there's still a really that there even more than ever there's a really important role that we have from a mission perspective and um so we've been you know digging up our old wilderness photos and putting them on our um our media feeds just for kind of beauty in the feeds and mental health and um we've been finding um good links for suggestions for things that folks can do just really close to home and enjoy the nature right outside the door. Um, and, uh, you know, and looking for creative ways to still um, invest in community, as Bill just said. So um, I, we, we've also been sharing really awful jokes, just silly jokes. And <laughs> um, so just, just being together, I think, um, has really helped. Yeah, I think, and I've appreciated that with with our team and community. All right, great. A couple what? other quick quick responses here, quick questions I'd like to to get through. Um, one question is from Autumn about SAW certification requirements. Will they be extended? And I'm just going to answer that that I know that the National SAW coordinator for the Forest Service is is reviewing the certification policy, and we should get some definitive answer from that. Uh, fairly soon. Ray, Jimmy, do you want to respond on that one? As well as the second question is, has the Forest Service uh, created a job hazard analysis for COVID activities or COVID responses? Yeah, I know, um, um, sorry, I know different regions uh, in region one where um, I believe we've already extended uh, SAW certifications um, for a year if they were set to expire this year. And I think other regions were looking at doing similar um, extensions. Yeah, and Randy, I would just add that I saw mm -hmm. the accreditation organizations medically are also extending uh, first aid and CPR certifications, not as lengthy. I think they're like 90 day extensions, but, uh, but obviously those are needed to keep your SAW certification valid too. Okay, great. Uh, Ray or Jimmy, do you know if the Forest Service has created a job hazard analysis for the COVID um, crisis? You know, I don't. I don't think they've done one on a national level. I know that each region, each region has set up an incident management team for the regions. And I'm sure within those that they've, uh, they probably looked at that. Uh, there is, I believe, there is one for the Washington office team. But um, we, did, we have not sent out, as far as I know, a, a boilerplate kind of JHA. Okay. Um, then there's a, another comment that maybe you could talk to is about grants and agreements. I know that almost all of our organizations have some sort of grants and agreements um, in place with the agency, and people are concerned about uh, whether there'll be some forgiveness for not meeting matches at this time because of the lack of donations or not being able to get volunteer in-kind contributions up to the level that we would anticipate. Um, there might be some deadline issues on meeting agreements. Is, is the agency talking and discussing about how to, to handle the grants and agreements piece of this, um, you know, some grace periods or uh, a willingness to be um, uh, make adjustments as needed, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, yeah. So there, we're trying to find all the flexibilities we can, uh, and and where there doesn't appear to be flexibility because of some regulatory rule, um, we are going to the department and and, and to the agency to to modify those um, a bit. And I know uh, um, we we can extend agreements fairly easy. Um, we've uh, done some modifications already on some agreements that uh, uh, Dusty has done. And uh, Dusty, I don't know if, if you're on the call, but um, if you are, you want to chime in a little bit? Let me find him and I'll let him talk here. All right, Dusty, your mic should be now active. Great. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Great. Yep. Yeah, so just work with your local unit who you have the agreement with and just check in with them. Uh, it should be fairly straightforward to do an agreement extension. Uh, we can extend agreements up to five years from the original date of signature. Um, and so, yeah, there should be a lot of flexibility built into the agreement process for the Forest Service. All right, great. Um, hey, Randy. I'd like to correct myself. The beauty of sitting at your computer is you can find out the info while you're here. And so um, region one and it's probably the same for other regions. Um, we are working with the national saw program manager. Um, we did put in a request for that one year extension. And right now the feeling is that that would apply to employees as well as partners and volunteers. So self correction there. Hey, Randy. Uh, no problem. It's a flexible situation. Yeah, go ahead. Randy, um, I just want to talk about the morale question real quick. One thing that, that we've found is that the asset of um, going virtual allows us to break down geographic boundaries that have previously been a barrier for people to network and collaborate. There's opportunities for new networks out there. And so if you're a um, place-based volunteer organization, you now have the opportunity, um, well, you've always had it, but now um, it might be your only opportunity or best opportunity to connect with other similar organizations from around the country that you might not have already um, had a had a connection to. And, and we're trying to connect our volunteer groups and members of those volunteer groups up and down the trail who might not have might not have had a reason to get in front of each other and talk about their craft. But now, because we're all in front of our computers a lot more, um, we have tools and mechanisms and a little bit of impetus in place to connect people through new networks, establish new networks for people to share their experiences and connect with other sort of like-minded folks. Um, and it doesn't have to be around a training or a specific deliverable, but just these social opportunities for folks to, instead of just being, you know, maybe with the Georgia Appalachian Trail Club, maybe we connect them with you know, the the Green Mountain Club up in Vermont and, and they could just have some time to talk to each other. So we're starting to look at new networks and, and the barriers that were in place geographically and, and otherwise that kept people from being together and hearing new and exciting and inspiring stories and, and what how technology um, might allow us to, to break down some of those barriers and create new networks. So that's just a, just a thought. All right, great, thank you. So our, our last comment or question uh, just was to, uh, we had one comment, uh, just I think it's a situation that's affecting many of our organizations is that we've got wilderness stewardship organizations very vested in doing work on the national forest and they want to get out there and do the, the job on the ground. And in the absence of forest closures, um, but the presence of shelter and home requirements they are still seeing hordes of people go to their lo particular locations and the impact that those people are causing uh, the, and there's nobody there to follow up with stewardship action. I think we all recognize that that's happening. I just want to share that with Ray and Jimmy so you guys can factor that into your Forest Service planning. Um, but it is something that's a reality on the ground um, and that we hope we can get people, get stewardship work back up and running quickly to help accommodate all of those impacts. So before we close out, uh, I just want to remind folks that this um, website or this webinar has been recorded, will be available on the NWSA website um, probably by tomorrow. 
Um, the PowerPoint is already available on the website if you want to download it for any of the links to the resources that are there. And we hope that everybody will stay safe and healthy. Before we close out, panelists, any last words or comments that you'd like to share with our audience? Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. I think we right. covered it. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, I just want to again thank, thank uh, all the 90 plus or close to 100 uh, groups that called in on this. Uh, I think th this, this format is, is something that's really important as we move through this um, this uh, this time in our lives and um, and and talk about uh, uh, this as uh, as Andrew brought up this this connection is a really a good way to to uh, help with your own personal health I found it with our staff at the Washington office and, and the bigger staff at the Washington yeah. office this new method whether it's through zoom or through teams or any of these formats um, has really been a, a, a has has opened up a connection uh, to groups that we normally maybe call once or twice a month maybe. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a shared need um, for information uh, from, from us, from the field and from the field from us um, and a uh, shared understanding of that we're all going through this together. And then on the, on the other end of this, we'll all come through okay. We just need to figure out how to get there and what to do while we're going through this journey. So um, I would I would encourage that we do these on some kind of regular basis, uh, Randy, if you can put these together. Yes, and that's one of the roles for the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance to bring the wilderness community together. Uh, we will certainly look at the, the needs as we move forward and um, assess the, the opportunity to, to do more town halls like this and sharing information. Again, we refer you to our website where we will keep all the information up to date as it's um, breaking. And um, we have a COVID-19 uh, working group that's developing protocols that will be useful for wilderness stewardship organizations. Even today, we um, had a discussion about transportation issues and what it's going to take to stand up uh, volunteer activities in this new arena and what are some of the considerations that people will have. And so we hope to make those resources available to the community fairly rapidly. So again, keep, keep in touch with our website and uh, we will stop for now. Thanks all the panelists for coming and participating today. Thank our audience for coming and visiting with us. Um, with that, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and end this webinar.